Welcome to the seventh annual Babakar Anjaye lecture being hosted for the first time ever in Africa. My name is Manal Bernoussi. I'm an international moderator from Morocco, and it is an absolute pleasure for me to welcome each and every one of you to my home country in this beautiful city of Marrakesh. So this lecture series, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the flagship events at the Afrik Zim Bank, set up to honor the legacy of late Dr. Babakar Ndiaye, who was a former president of the African Development Bank. He was extremely influential in the creation and establishment of this bank that you all know today as the African Export Import Bank. Now, this year is a very special year as it coincides with the 30th anniversary of the bank under the overarching theme, delivering the vision, building prosperity for Africans. This year's lecture will continue the tradition established through the first years of the series, addressing key issues facing Africa in the 21st century. And so this year's theme focuses on the new world order and the future of entrepreneurship in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to introduce to you our first speaker at today's event. To his team, he's more than just a leader. He is a source of inspiration. He is fearless. He is bold. He dreams big. He leads a 30 billion US dollar bank, yet he is so relatable. He's a family man with a big heart, a devoted father to three wonderful girls, and his commitment goes beyond his immediate family as he is a genuine Pan-Africanist. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to His Excellency Professor Benedict Rama, President of Afrik Zim Bank. Thank you. Sir Jean Clifton, a distinguished guest speaker and chairman of Gallup USA. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Governors of Central Banks, Senior Government Officials, my colleagues at the Frexing Bank, Executives, Management and Staff, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. Just over a month ago, the world awoke to a devastating earthquake that caused massive casualties and widespread destruction 
of infrastructure here in Morocco, just a few kilometers from where we sit today. On behalf of the Board of Directors and Management of Afrexin Bank, and on behalf of all of us gathered here tonight, I extend our heartfelt condolences to His Majesty the King, King Mohammed VI, the government of the Kingdom of Morocco, and the people of Morocco for the irreparable losses. At this challenging time, our prayers are with you, your families, and the families of the departed. Despite your loss, Morocco has shown strength and resolve in assembling the world just a few kilometers away from the epicenter of the earthquake. That is what is called resilience. As the people of Morocco contend with the consequences of that catastrophic accident, incident, may I therefore respectfully invite us all to stand so that we can observe a moment of silence in honor of the victims of the earthquake. <clears throat> May their souls rest in peace. On that, may you sit down, please. On that solemn note, Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, I welcome you all to the seventh edition of the Babaka and Diaye Lecture Series, which has become an established event after the bank holds on the sidelines of the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank to honor the visionary former president of African Development Bank, Dr. Babakan Diaye, who championed the founding of Afrexin Bank. I thank you all for sparing time for your demanding, very busy schedules to join us today. Your participation in this event attests to, among others, your profound appreciation of the work and legacy of the late Dr. Babaka Ndiaye, one of Africa's foremost institutional builders. He was a transgenerational leader who created a present bank to deal with the difficulties of the time, but also recognized the importance in crafting Africa-led solutions for Africa's transformation. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Event after event remind us every day of the rapid evolution of the world we live in. The collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s elevated multilateralism and paved the way for globalization. The emergence of the World Trade Organization in 1994 set the stage for a rule-based multilateral system, which in turn accelerated global trade volumes, capital flows, as well as technological advancement and transfer across borders. For instance, global trade expanded rapidly from about 2 trillion US dollars in 1980 to about 7 trillion dollars in the year 2000, and more than tripled by 2022 to 24 trillion US dollars. For the late 1990s, Global trade grew faster than world output for so many years. Foreign direct investment flows also quickened dramatically to $1.4 trillion in 2000, compared to a mere $55 billion in 1980. With freer movement of goods, capital, and technology across borders, and with the opening up of China in the early 1980s, Western style entrepreneurial risk taking and business building flourished around the world, blossoming especially in Asia. All the indicators at that time pointed to what could, we could call the golden age of entrepreneurship. The number of registered companies ballooned. Billionaires began to emerge where none existed earlier. 
and stock exchanges mushroomed with rapid acceleration in their trading volumes. The number of entrepreneurs, especially tech entrepreneurs, also rose rapidly. By the 2010s, however, it appeared that globalization was beginning to run its course. This contentment from displaced factory workers in the US and Europe was becoming audible, exposing the, the flaw in the manner globalization was implemented. Globalization as implemented freed the movement of goods, capital, and technology while restricting the movement of labor, that's the movement of people. As a result, instead of attracting cheaper labor from poorer developing countries to factory floors in the West, immigration restrictions and labor market rigidities prevented that from happening, forcing the owners of capital to chase profit by moving labor-intensive manufacturing facilities to centers of cheap labor, and then re-exported the goods that were produced there back home. Over time, the manufacturing base in the West declined. The evidence exists in the Midwest of the USA. The discontent of the, of the army of displaced blue collar workers and unprecedented political had un unprecedented political consequences, leading to the emergence of anti-globalization sentiments and movements amongst political parties and candidates across most of the economies of the West. In Europe, it even caused a schism with Britain exiting the European Union. Under President Trump, the US launched a major trade war against China. Tariff and non-tariff barriers became widespread. The WTO dispute settlement body became decapitated and un unable to function. Other events that followed have also accelerated the move from globalization through globalization to outright deglobalization. The supply chain drama seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ukraine crisis and the attendant sweeping Western sanctions, and even increasingly devastating consequences of climate change have also combined to trigger new thinking about the way business is done globally. Nearshoring and French shoring have all entered the lexicons of international economic relations. The impact on entrepreneurship as we knew it at the height of globalization is becoming apparent. Foreign direct investment flows to developing countries have slowed. Restrictions on technology transfers have risen. Trade barriers have restricted access to markets. The political turmoil has increased country risks and cross-border capital flows, including portfolio flows to developing countries have slowed, impacting the growth of startups. In other words, building businesses across the developing world has become much more difficult and riskier. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you agree with me that the world as we know it has dramatically changed. And it has changed for the worse at a time when Africa was expecting to benefit from globalization that pulled almost a billion people out of poverty in China. However, as businesses explore new investment destinations, they can either consider their home country or elsewhere. And I ask, what of Africa? What must we do to attract these investments in Africa and begin to again trigger the growth of entrepreneurship on the continent? To assist us with a more informed insight on this issue and perhaps guide us on a pathway for Africa under current circumstances is our distinguished guest speaker, Mr. Jim Clifton. Mr. Clifton, who is the chair of Gallup, a global analytics and advisory firm, has a wealth of experience and influence in the world of business. 
In a modern world of increasing conflicts, hostilities, and uncertainties, Jim provides an apt description of an entrepreneur. He said, and I quote, an entrepreneur is a person of action, one who possesses an unnatural overload of two attributes, optimism and determination. Because entrepreneurs are optimistic, they don't see barriers. Because they are determined, they never quit. Individuals who possess extreme amounts of optimism and determination get things done, unquote. He will today speak on the topic, the new world order and the future of entrepreneurship in Africa. As a sought after global business champion, we understand how busy he could be. We are therefore most pleased that he chose to set aside other vital commitments to join us here to do today to share his experience and knowledge with us. Please join me in welcoming our dear friend and keynote speaker today, Mr. Jim Clifton. I look forward to an insightful lecture and thank you all for joining us today and for your kind attention. You guys, it's great to be. It's great to be with you. I'm not, you know, over my over my career, you give a lot of speeches, and I'm I'm not sure that there's been one where I've been more honored. It really means a lot uh, to me, uh, Dr. Orama, that you'd uh, in, invite invite me here. And uh, I also want to say uh, to, to to the uh, family of Nudaya, thank you and. Uh, I, I think I can feel I think I can feel your father's presence, and um, thank you. You know, I was sitting here, and uh, Ryan, who's sitting next to me, said, "Are you nervous?" I said, "For this speech, I'm particularly nervous because I'm wondering about if everybody in the room is smarter than I am." I'm originally, I don't. I don't think I know anybody here, but I, I live and work in Washington, D.C. My family's been there for about 25 years. But I'm originally from Nebraska. And so if that's the United States, if you put your finger right in the middle, that would be where my, my, my house was. And that's kind of cattle ranching and corn. And my wife's side, of the, I've been married for 40 years to a farm girl. And um, her family's there. My family's from cattle ranches. My dad was a um, sheep farmer or a sheep rancher. By the way, when I say ranches, think very small. Don't think like the show Yellowstone. These are, these are pretty poor, poor places out there. But <clears throat> um, I studied business at the University of Nebraska. My dad was actually a, per, a professor there. But there's a joke that follows me around on the East Coast. It's not a joke. It's actually a true story. Nebraska, our nickname is the Cornhuskers. It's like you shuck corn or something like that. We had a very, very good football team, American football team. And uh, there was a big game, ABC was there, and a lady was interviewing Nebraska's very best player. Now remember, there's some concern about how smart we all are out there in the middle, you know, they call them the flyover states and that kind of a thing. So we're a little sensitive about it. But this player is one of the best to ever play college football and he's sitting there and you know American football there's a white helmet and he's got a white helmet in his lap. Football helmet and on it is a block letter N, just a letter N, a real nice red. <clears throat> she gets done with the interview. And she says to this guy. <laughs> she says to him, it was the, all the other questions were fine about sports and how are you going to win and that kind of thing. All of a sudden she stops in her last question to this guy is, if the N on your helmet didn't stand for Nebraska, what might it stand for? He thought, and thought he really wanted to get this right. He finally said, I'd have to say knowledge. <laughs> well, 
as I make a few, as I make a few comments, make sure a little voice in the back of your head is saying, hey, that guy may not be sure how to spell knowledge, <laughs> may not be able to spell it. So I've, um, the group of us bought Gallup back in 1988, and I've had a real privilege. Uh, Dr. Gallup was my, my, my Gandhi. You know, he was an Iowan, an Iowa professor. You guys, I was in my, it'd be about a hundred years ago, he was a grad student, and old Joe Pulitzer down at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, hundred years ago, he had one of the best papers in the world, and Joe Pulitzer thought, I make this newspaper, but every time I go to the train station, the, the readers are only reading the funny pages and the baseball scores. And I'm spending all this time making this really great news. Now you gotta get exactly what happened. I love stuff like this. There was no concept for public opinion polling 100 years ago. That concept wasn't there. So old Joe Pulitzer said, interview every single person in St. Louis, interview them all. So George, he, and he still ranks in the top 100 most influential Americans, the real good list with George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, and that, there's other ones around, Time Magazine, where they have chefs and all that. He's one of our 100 most in, influential. So, but anyway, he was just a student. He went down, he wanted to make some money. He liked the idea of going door to door. So he did that. And they got some, but they sort of interviewed every single person. But then he goes back to the University of Iowa and he goes to the ag department as a grad student. And um, he says to the agriculture guys, don't you have some way that you sample dirt? And they went, yeah, we do that. And he said, well, how does it work? And he says, well, you don't need to test the whole field. Think about it, you don't need to test the whole population of St. Louis, but you randomly select dirt samples and then you can figure it out. This changed the world. Dr. Gallup said, well, <laughs> he said, do you think you could do that with people? And the ag guys said, I don't know, I don't see why not. And that started public opinion polling. Dr. Gallup wasn't an entrepreneur. He was a guy wandering around that wanted to try to figure out one thing and that's what's the great American dream. He was almost like Aristotle, just, just driven to figure out the will, of, uh, the will of the people. And then as he worked away and then under, with, my, with myself and my teams, we built the samples out around the world, 160 countries. We interview all the states in Africa every, every year, especially on questions about how your, how's your life going and, and um, also, the, also the will. He um, <clears throat> went on to do some market research, but I want to say this about a man that I love. I didn't know him that well. One of the greatest thinkers of his time, but not a very good builder. You see what I mean? Myself, I'm not a very good thinker, <laughs> but I'm an above average builder. And so then my teams took what Dr. Gallup did and build it into a, into a worldwide organization. I would have absolutely nothing at all if it wasn't for that great thinker. He wouldn't have built much himself if it wasn't for my team, and, um, uh, myself and my, my teams. But you see that? There's something about a cart and a horse that the whole world might be missing. I think the world's biggest problem right now, we have so many of them, environment, they all bother me. But you know, we stopped growing, not just the United States, not just Europe, not just that, but the whole world has slowed down. I don't need to tell you guys what GDP is, I, but I, I like to think of it as just all the stuff we make and sell each other. Then you, then you add that up. But you know, GDP per capita in the United States, and this is true for the whole world, of course, GDP divided by all the people has been in deceleration. It means it just keeps going down. So it means that we have less and less money per person in the United States and Africa and every, everywhere else. Well, I got concerned about that. So I started wondering, what's the very source of economic energy? I, I know some of the biggest economists in the world. Hell, they didn't know. 
And they'll start saying things like, well, stimulus packages and fiscal tools. I don't even know. I don't know what those things are. I kind of do. But you know, what they eventually get to is innovation. Innovation drives economic growth. I just have one question. So many world leaders in here, and important people. Are you sure? Are you sure innovation drives growth? Because if you're wrong, Africa is going to keep, Africa is going to keep increasing at a decreasing rate. If you're wrong, are you open to that? Every place I go, people are trying to drive innovation. You know, you go to Saudi Arabia, they build whole cities of innovation. Isn't that interesting? Gigantic cities. And then they go over and they'll try to like bring MIT to um, uh, Doha, or, or I know Doha is not in Saudi Arabia, but in uh, Riyadh or you guys, that's an experiment right now. They don't know it. The Saudis don't know it. Neither does United Arab Emirates or Qatar. They're doing an experiment because they have spent more money on innovation per person than anybody in the world. And you know what's come out of there with new businesses? Nothing. Right now, you can go to a website and you can get um, all the active unicorns in the world. There's about 1,200 of them. United States has about 650. China has about 225. India has about 100. You guys, this is really a wonderful place to try to spot economic, ec economic energy. England has quite a few. They'll have like 60. Maybe France and Germany come up around 20 or 30. But you say, how many unicorns with all of that? I mean, you guys, it's trillions of dollars, and there's none of it. But you know what they don't know? Nobody said to them, are you sure that it's innovation that drives economic growth. Anybody know who Vint Cerf is? No? So he and a guy named Bob Kahn got packets to fly across fiber optics. So Motorola had figured out how to get voice to fly. But, you, but the military said, we need data to fly. You know what the conversation is about, don't you? It's the internet. And they said it was impossible because they couldn't get data. And then he figured out about packets and, he, and they got it done. Vince Cerf's not much older than I am. He's, he's walking around. He has an office in the Gallup building in Washington. But one of the things that struck me years ago when I first met him was he said, people think I'm an entrepreneur. It's such, it's such a rich thought. Vince Cerf doesn't have an entrepreneurial bone in his body, Dr. Cerf. What he invented is bigger than what Thomas Edison invented. And we think that Vince's an entrepreneur. And then you know what we do? We go look for more Vince surfs and nothing comes out of it. And Vince will tell you. I've written about it. I said, Vince, is it okay if I say this? He goes, yeah, it's okay. He's sitting in his office. So the military had the internet for about seven years, sending stuff around and all of that. It was actually Al Gore. You know the jokes about Al Gore, but Al Gore loved data and he loved technology. And he came over and saw Vint and he said to Vint, can I see what that is you made? He went, yeah, sure, Senator. Gore was the Senator. Anyway, he got that out and he showed him the whole thing. And Gore said, oh my God, this is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. Uh, do you mind if I go back to the Senate and create an act, it turned out to be the Gore Act, and throw this out to commerce. Do you know what an important moment that was? You guys, it starts with a misunderstanding because we're still not clear about it. This is exactly what Vince Cerf said back to Al Gore. Fine with me, but I don't see what value it'll have to any businesses. That's a guy with an IQ of about 170. But see, that's different than the person that goes and does what? Finds a customer. If you just want a little activity with all, the, you know, we all have innovators around us and people want us to put money in and all of that. Remember this, 
no matter what the innovation is, whether it's the internet or somebody starting some kind of a new way to make ice cream, that innovation has no value whatsoever until a customer is standing next to it. I think the only people in the world that know that are me and you. Because we keep trying to pack the place with innovation and, and think how good we are. I mean, you can be a young kid somewhere in Nairobi and boy, if you got a high IQ, they'll find you. You can be really poor in Watts in Los Angeles, in the worst neighborhood. But man, if you can read and write and recall and reason faster than all the other kids, we find you. And you know what happens? You're on your way, <laughs> you're on your way to a better high school, and they find out, and then pretty soon you're on your way to Stanford. And then from Stanford, you get your graduate degree at MIT, and then you go on to DARPA. But you see what it is? That is so systematic, the development of intellectual, intellectual ability. But we keep saying to ourselves, that's where business pops out of. There's a, I had a client for a long time. His name was Wayne Huizinga. You ever heard of him? Here, yeah, okay. Um, Dr. Fofak has, thank you, Dr. Fofak. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, thank you. I need, sometimes I feel like I need to go places to get this off my chest. But Wayne Izinga didn't graduate from high school. You know why? Because he didn't feel he needed to. He had too much to do. It's hard to do, but you can do it. You can go from nothing in the United States and build a Fortune 500 company in one lifetime. He was a garbage, a trash collector. I call him garbage man. Wayne Izinga was a was a trash collector. He not only built waste management in one lifetime, he's the only one that's built two and then three. Nobody's built two Fortune 500 companies. It looks like Elon Musk, Elon Musk will. But I've always wondered, let's say that this is an investment meeting and Wayne Huizinga came and he's a trash collector. And you know, waste management as a multi-zillion dollar all green company stocks been great and all of that you guys this his innovation was why don't we start a trash collecting company you and i would have said to him i think we have those i don't i don't, I don't think we need those of course what i hadn't thought of is maybe he'll build the best maybe he'll build the best one in the world but none of us would have invested in that but you know what you were talking right then not to the idea guy but to an entrepreneur I helped him with the next idea, it was called Blockbuster. <laughs> his, his idea was to rent movie tapes, this, you know, those kind like that that you put in, in strip malls. I did some research for him actually on it. He wanted me to help him with it. And he says, what, what do you think of the idea? And I said, it's terrible, I don't like it. And I said, it doesn't, doesn't have much demand or anything. <laughs> when you have an entrepreneur like that, that's built three, four, three, five, when you tell them they can't do something, do you know what they do? It's a good test for them. They just write down what you told them. And that's what they start working on the next shoot. You, you know this, don't you? They just start, they just start working on, on that. You know, if you want to manage an entrepreneur, just every morning, get up and tell them you'll never do that. And they'll just, they'll just go like, they'll just, they'll just go like, they'll go like crazy. Um, he built Blockbuster into a second. Then his next idea was uh, selling used cars, and he built AutoNation, his third one. He met the trash collection, renting tapes. and But I always say, what if, what, what if somebody would have given him a good idea? You know, <laughs> but, you know entre entrepreneurs don't necessarily, don't necessarily have, to, have to have them. You know, there was, there was a lady that picked up on an idea. You know, it's where it's a garage sale. You all know what a garage sale is. And the big idea was, you know, so you can buy like an old snow shovel or you can buy an old broken fishing reel. Maybe you're going to fix it or, oh, Christmas, I don't know, whatever. But the idea was, what if it was the biggest garage sale, sale a garage sale in the world and you could buy on it 24 seven, just any time you wanted. What, what was that company called? Meg Whitman built it. 
Yeah, eBay, that's, <laughs> that's, that's eBay. But then you start thinking, is it the idea or is it the rain, is it the rain, is it the rainmaker? So right now, if we took a thousand kids from Ethiopia, let's just do a hundred. And I lined a hundred kids up right here. Where we live in world leadership time right now, do you know what we can do with those hundred kids? We can line them up by IQ and man, it works. Real smart ones up here all the way down, medium and the dumb ones down at the end. That's a crude way to say it, but I'm from Nebraska. These kids up here give them all the same book. They will read the book faster, recall more, and can reason more. And these guys don't. You see what I mean? It works. But I've always wondered if that's why we've exploded with innovation or that, that we have a total oversupply of innovation. Now, for you coaches in there or sports nuts who love soccer or football or whatever it is, you know what else we can line them up by? How fast they are. Boy, does that work. Whoever the fastest ones are, you put them up here and we know. And we can be damn sure we're right about IQ and we can be damn sure we're right about speed. But you know what? Here's where we get stumped. And it's the question that we need to fix the whole world right now. Line them up by their likelihood to build a business, a big one. And you know what? That becomes an argument and it can't be an argument. We've all got to get on the same page. And we got to understand that innovation is really important. That's over here. But the rainmakers are over here. Call them entrepreneurs, call them builders, whatever that is. And make this as systematic and intentional as we've made this, and everything will change. You wonder about world order. The world's GDP is about $100 trillion right now. If we grow at 3% over the next generation, it'll be $200 trillion. That's failure. Everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong when we grow at 3%. Now, you guys, if we grow at 45 I'm doing the world right now, it goes to 300 trillion. 300 trillion works. But you say, how do we get there? We've got to consider that that's a cart and a horse. And I, I would um, suggest to you that that card is innovation and that horse is entrepreneurship. And we got to get really, really good at the horse part. I want to be real specific here. I got a list, my team got a list of the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies. I love it because half of the people are immigrants or sons and daughters of immigrants. There's something about immigrants that they got a little more juice than the, those of us that have, that have, that have been here have been here a long time and we put them in a sample and what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a psych psychological portrait think of it as an iq test but it's not it's a rainmaker test it's an entrepreneurial test and we had a very different pro what we were trying to figure out was is a really good question of, of the 1.5 billion people in Africa. Do we have any Steve Jobs is walking around here and we don't know it? That's the question you ought to be asking. I'm all for innovation. My company sells innovation. I'm not either oring these. I'm saying this one we don't understand. We don't understand very well. The answer to how many Steve Jobs there are, this blows me away. I, I, um, I'm chairman now, but I ran Gallup for, Dr. Gallup ran it for 40 years. I missed him by four, then I ran it for about, about 35. But the Steve Job, he's a genius. There are five in a thousand. So in Africa, if you have 1.5 billion people, that'd be 1.5 million and then times five would be set the quick math on it is you guys there are seven and a half steve jobs or meg whitman type people walking around on that continent and you know what not a one of us in the room know who they are there's about the same number of real high iq people walking around this continent and you know what we know where every friggin one of them are but if you said what's a solution 
we got to have a dragnet. Africa needs a dragnet. The United States really needs a dragnet. It really helps if we can keep busy, if we can lead the way on, on, on business uh, pumping. So it does, I'm not going to say the name of the school, but it's a really famous American school. This is my last highlight. And again, thank you for letting me get this off my chest. But it's the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It's one of the hardest to get in in the world. They only take 50 people. 50. Their dean says, I want them to take that test that you guys made, that Gallup made, of the fastest growing companies in the world. And I want to see how they score on it. It's an internet, a little internet test. You can get it yourself, or I'll, get, I'll send a whole bunch of them to you, Dr. Fofang. This is my, <laughs> this is my, my sort of my case closing comment on this, but of the 50 kids, matching the ink fastest growing companies in the world not one of the 50 did all 50 of them have perfect sat scores which is 1600 every single one of them did i can't imagine how fast they would beat me in a new york times crossword puzzle so anyway one of the people at gallup go calls me and says jim we really got a problem at this famous university. I said, what is it? Said, um, all of them got a zero uh, from the coolest innovation and entrepreneurial thing, maybe in the, maybe in the world, to be one of the top five. And they want to see you right away. I didn't want to do it on the phone or Zoom, so I went, I took a train up and, but anyway, the guy, when I walked into his office, I noticed he wasn't mad. I noticed he didn't look like me, like I was a Martian from outer space. I, I knew he had something. And he said, how do you explain this is the best school and that's what you got for us? All of them failed. I told him the truth. I said, I don't know. I said, but I think you have something. And he said, I do. He said, for the years that it's been there, maybe 20, he said, not one business, not one business has ever come out of there. You could rest your case just on just on that. But <clears throat> what we did at, Nebraska, at the University of Nebraska, where I said my, my dad was a professor there, what we do is when the thousands of kids come in, we just screen them all. We shoot them all through an internet, just like you do an IQ test. Then we start picking them out. We start picking out builders. But until we can get early identification of them, and I'd recommend that you do this uh, for the whole continent of Africa, and remember, when I talk high potential, I'm talking not two times more likely or three, I'm talking 100 times more likely to build a to build a big business. This continent has plenty of talent, maybe more talent than anywhere else out of this 1.5 billion. And there's no reason why you can't build the biggest businesses in the world right here once you figure out, but you got to get probability in your advantage or you waste so much time with people that, that can't really, really build them. I'm um, very hopeful. It's the only talent that we've ever seen at Gallup where if you line up a, a thousand people, whether it's rich white kids up in the Northeast or whether it's very poor minorities in Mississippi, you guys, every time it's five in a thousand. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an enormous breakthrough. God wasn't equal in handing out a lot of things, ability to sing, ability to run. But with entrepreneurship, he was very egalitarian. He handed it out equally and just as equally with women. One of the biggest opportunities that the world has right now is to get women in this, in this game more. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could probably double or, double or triple, triple that. I wanna make, I'm, I, I talked a little too long there and we can pick up stuff and questions here, but I wanna make one other point. My first, I had two points. My first point was the world, the world doesn't 
isn't clear on the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship. And we can get it straightened out. You got to get it straightened out. That's your job as leaders. I want you to be open to the second thing, and that is we don't have any idea at all how to manage people. God, that whole thing is not advanced in 50 years. Universities, the very best ones, ones where I've been visiting, blah, 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 and all that. Uh, some of them throw the word distinguished around pretty loosely. But <clears throat> the, the, the very best universities don't know how to develop people. So we did a once and for all study at Gallup, and we had 30 million em, uh, employees in the sample. And because they were all clients all around the world, Africa, everywhere, and because they were all clients, we tied them to outcomes. And our teams were able to raise up 400,000 teams, bank, a lot of banks, agricultural companies, um, retail companies, fashion, all of them. But clear up here, these teams had enormous amount of success. And then you could rank order them, one to 400,000. And these down here just fail at everything they did, really lousy teams. But so then what you learn in business school is performance management techniques, and we fill out forms on each other. And there's some place where Dr. Fofax number one and Jim's number 10, and he gets paid a little more and all of that. <laughs> Do you know none of those work with God as my witness? If you can bring any data to me, I will give you Gallup. None of them work. But see, the problem with that is, is that when we start a company, we can't build it because we don't know how to inspire and develop people. But again, this is just one little breakthrough for you to think about. And uh, the, our chief scientist, I wrote a book on what right to number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. I'd say that just because I know the demand is so high for trying to figure out how to manage people. But I challenged him and I said, give me the definition of management. And I said, I do not want to hear Harvard Business Review words. I can't take that. I don't want to hear those words at all. You got to define management with math, an activity in math that I can understand the first time you tell it to me. And he said, the single activity that's most defining is having one meaningful conversation with each employee per week, period. That was his Peter Drucker moment. And I said, what did you learn from that? And he said, I think what I learned is all the things that we do that don't matter. And he said, I think what I learned is that in the absence of that one meaningful conversation, you're not developing or leading people. You're just keeping, you're just keeping track of them. But I think I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. But I think we've been attracted, Africans, Europeans. I think we've been attracted to what's easy. And it's easier to manage intellectual development. Managing entrepreneurial spirit is really hard and really messy and difficult to build a, build a strategy around. But that's where all the big money is. The United States isn't doing very well right now, but to have half of all the active unicorns in the whole world is a good, is a good sign. But if you said, with all Gallup's time doing this, what would you recommend African leaders for them to get the biggest share of the next hundred trillion? Isn't that amazing? It takes us 500 years to get to one trillion, now in 25, 100 trillion, and now in 25 years we'll be at 200 trillion. The question you got to ask yourself is how can we get a disproportionate share of that? There's all kinds of minerals, stuff in the earth, can grow about anything you want in Africa, but the big, big, big money is still in the human spirit, and we haven't done a very good job of unlocking that. Thank you again for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jim Clifton, for this insightful keynote.
I'm going to keep you just a little longer with me on stage. If you can please join me and uh, take your seat here, I'm going to call also His Excellency Professor Benedict Orama, President of Africa Zimbang, to join me on stage as we are excited to delve a little deeper on this topic. Let me first um, start with a first question to you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Why is this topic of entrepreneurship, why would it be so important to Babakar and Dae? Well, thank you very much. Let me, let me join you in um, uh, congratulating Jim for very insightful presentation on the issue of entrepreneurship and um, helping us to design the difference between entrepreneurship or some of the things we think represent entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Well, Dr. Babakan Diaye, who founded our Flexing Bank, was a strong institution builder. He created most of the institutions that are making a huge difference on the continent. A Flexing Bank, I think Africa Re, Shelter Freak. He also created Africa Business Roundtable. At the time, uh, the the level of entrepreneurship on the continent was very low. Uh, he thought uh, that it would generate trade amongst African countries, it would lead to, to growth in business building on the continent if we got African businesses to come together under the round table and share experience and so on. So uh, he did that. So he understood the power of entrepreneurship. And when he created small institutions like a Frexin Bank, he also, uh, in the charter establishing the bank, he gave you the powers that will enable it to support the growth of uh, businesses on the continent. Uh, take uh, the way the shareholding of the bank was structured. They deliberately did not make it a wholly government-owned institution. He had a class, a class B, that was reserved for African financial institutions and private investors. And I remember very well at the beginning of the bank, because in some countries they didn't really have a private sector. The governments took the shares and said that as their private sector emerged, they would then sell the shares to the private sector. So why I've just given all these examples to tell you uh, that Dr. Mubaka and Diaye recognized that the vision he saw for the continent uh, using uh, African capital, African, an African bank to develop the continent would not be possible without also creating the businesses, the entrepreneurs that would build the businesses that such a bank could finance. That is why it is important today as the world continues to evolve uh, that we bring it out, bring it out in such a way that we um, are able to look ahead and uh, define uh, what uh, entrepreneurship will mean in the work our Flexin Bank is doing, in the work other banks on the continent are doing like us, and also uh, what entrepreneurship will mean for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement implementation. That is the reason, and that's why we thought that we couldn't find a better person to tell us this. Uh, but uh, Jim, who has had a long experience, as you, you just learned, doing this in 
America, where I would say where we, what we, where we can call the capital of entrepreneurship. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing that. Really interesting indeed. Um, now, Mr. Clifton, the concept of builders that you mentioned as early identified high potential entrepreneurs is really an interesting one, an intriguing one. My question to you is how can countries and institutions effectively identify and nurture these builders to drive entrepreneurial success? Um, does that work? Does that work? Um, I, I think testing works. And, and what you're really doing is you're building a, a profile. You know, there's um, um, the, the test that we give is a test that nobody really fails. What you're trying to find out is when you st I started a market research company 50 a long, long time ago, but you have to have the alpha customer person. That's the entrepreneur. Nothing works without that. But it's like the three musketeers. There's two other people. One is what we call the conductor, and that's the manager. And the other one is the expert. I started a market research company. I was a customer person, and I had a manager that made sure the people felt good. They got paid on time. Our promises were good. And then I went and hired a crusty old advanced statistician PhD. So when he walked in the room, you get the point. But if we started a Mexican restaurant and you're the customer person and he runs the place, somebody's got to make the food really, really, I got to be an ex. you got to have a great cook. But so in the tests that we built, they're not that hard to build, you guys, is all you're doing is trying to sort through. And what you're looking for is really unusual determination. Um, another one is a natural eye for disruption. When you're sitting with them, they'll go, hey, did you notice way that if you could move this and you could put the cards over here and you could do, do that. Another one is they really get a kick, Mr. President, out of profitability. They're really trying to make money. When I'm sitting alone with them, I say, let me just get this right. You're trying to become as rich as you possibly can, right? And they say yes and famous. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but it's good if you can have some kind of a profile it's not good to have kids flunk. But so what it says, and remember, those two guys with me, they both, they both passed away, but they were rich when they passed away. And they weren't the entrepreneur, you see what I mean? And so there's a, there's a place in there for, for three different, and so then this particular profile just says, so then we give it to just hundreds of thousands of them. And then, so um, my foundation and Gallup put, put a bunch of dough into something. And then we have what we call Clifton Builders. They even have jackets they wear around on, cam on, on campus. But we wanted to go into their head that God put them on earth to build something. And, but I think that what I would recommend is that you do, we can help you make them. There's other companies that can too. But get something on the internet and, and go find 100,000 of them. Uh, 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 put a jacket on it. You could name it after Mr. President here. You, you could be. You could become a Orama builder. <laughs> and then, but but see, you set an expectation, and you're setting an expectation with the right kind of young man or woman. Because w what's really cruel is to try to convince somebody they're entrepreneur when they're not. Have you ever thought about being an entrepreneur? Well, if they say, no, I haven't, that's not your person. But, but I, I, I would recommend that, first of all, you do that. Once you get them in, then everybody ought to be assigned a, a mentor. They ought to get some kind of um, part-time job if they're going to college. A lot of these kids drop out, doesn't matter, but, but, but still keep a link on them. Thank you very much. We do like that idea, right? We need to try that out. Um, and it speaks to the power of mindset. It speaks to the importance of mentorship. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Now, speaking about the younger generation, um, Mr. President Orama, the lecture highlighted the role indeed of these young millennials and Generation Z in, um, in shaping winners and losers in this evolving uh, global economy. How is Africa Zimbank engaging with the younger generation? 
uh, and empowering them to become key drivers of economic development in Africa. Oh, thank you very much. We recognize that uh, the continent is the continent of the future. Um, anyone you talk to, the first thing they will tell you, oh, Africa has the youngest population in the world. Um, we have um, more than 50% of the population under the age of 25, and so on and so forth, which is very good. But we recognize at Afrexim Bank that this can be an asset, it can also be a bomb. Uh, although every time we talk about it, we assume that having many children and uh, young people everywhere would immediately bring us to that El Dorado we are looking for. Uh, but it can also bring, send us to the, the doors of hell because the young people don't have jobs and uh, if they don't have jobs, they will run all of us out of town. So we recognize it at our Frexing Bank and that is why what we, everything we do is focused and then we recognize that the, most of the people that will be needing the services of our Frexing Bank will be the younger generation. And that's why we have what we call Bank of the Future Project. And that Bank of the Future Project, uh, we expect it to be very digitally driven. Uh, we have a, what we call the Africa Trade Gateway. That Africa Trade Gateway is, cre uh, is creating or has created um, a different kind of bank where, and where we can provide facilities digitally, but also the younger people can get into that platform and do all the businesses they need to do. They can identify markets. Uh, they can uh, find out the regulations uh, uh, surrounding that market. Uh, they can do customer due diligence there. They can make payments uh, using the, uh, the, uh, the payment uh, services we have on the platform. They can actually uh, do logistics, get logistics services through the e-logistics and so on and so forth. So we think that that's the bank of the future. But beyond that, we are also uh, making sure that today that the young people participate and benefit from the work we do. Uh, we have a big uh, creative, um, uh, creative program, uh, the Creative Africa Nexus. Under that Creative Africa Nexus, we, we cover all aspects of the creative industry, from sports, to fashion, to music, to um, movies, uh, even the, 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 uh, the normal uh, um, culinary uh, art, and so on. We have developed the financing instruments and we finance all the people who are in those activities we, we started funding with the, uh, we started with $500 million initially. That has now expanded to $1 billion. Uh, we also have the fund, the Fund for Export Development in Africa. That fund now has a venture capital element there. And our venture capital element is to help us support uh, startups, to help us support the accelerator program we are launching to make sure that businesses that are scaling up are supported. We know that they are still risky, but they need patient capital. And there is a very, very, very uh, low supply of that kind of capital on the continent. So that's why we created that uh, venture uh, capital. Apart from the venture capital, we have the normal impact equity fund. So if those companies graduate, we also are able to support them with the normal um, uh, equity fund, apart from the other facilities we do. We also have an SME program. The SME program is essentially targeting uh, the, the, the youth, the businesses that are done uh, by the youth. If you uh, come to the Inter-African Trade Fair, the third edition that we're holding in Egypt from 9 to 15th, you will see a big pavilion uh, that is being run by us, uh, AE, uh, AE Trade and African Union and AFTHA Secretariat that is dedicated to the youth. 
And there we, we, we have a competition that helps to enable us to identify uh, uh, specific uh, youth businesses that we are able to support. And when we say support them, it's other accelerator program to make sure that uh, the businesses succeed. We get the financing, the technical advice, uh, market access that are required. So we have a comprehensive uh, a solution to the youth uh, to make sure that uh, as the, the continent continues to grow in terms of the, um, the number of youth that uh, it has, that we do not end up having uh, youth that are not employed, we do not end up uh, finding ourselves in a situation where this becomes a major problem to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for walking us through uh, these uh, initiatives. Um, one last question to you before we engage with the, the audience, um, Mr. Clifton. What are the economists missing here? What is your perspective on that? I think, I think economists need to make a highlight to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, Danny Kahneman got the Nobel Prize in behavioral economics. He's, he was actually a psychologist. He wasn't an economist. You know what he figured out? We helped him do it. He was a senior scientist. But of all the decisions that we make in life, an economist assumes that you're taught that man is rational. Now, back when they did this, ladies, they, they should have said man and women but that man is rational. This, is, this blows me away, but, but, but what we do as economists, I'm not one, but we assume that everybody makes a rational decision. Basically, what's the best value for the amount, that every deal, is the, uh, every deal is the amount of money on the table, and it basically never is. But, but what he went on to prove with our massive samples is that when you make a decision, 30% is rational, and that includes the woman you pick to marry or the man you pick, what car you pick, where you sat tonight. 70% is emotional and 30% is rational. And economists haven't built out that 70% at all. One example is that the single best question you can ask anyone in the world, and Dr. Gallup figured this out, I'll do it with you guys. <clears throat> On a scale of zero to 10, with zero being the, and we ask everybody in Africa this, so if you say I want this for my country, type me and I'll just send it right to you. With zero being the worst life imaginable and 10 being the best life imaginable, where are you on that scale today? And you want it with especially young males. Young males, when they give that low score, young males get very, very dangerous. Women are more rational, apparent, apparently. But... <clears throat> So, but, but so let's say that I say I'm a seven, and the next question is the money question. And I think that this is a number that, that we should put on every single, uh, that, that economists should have on every country. The next question is where would be on that same scale in five years? And that's where we finally found hope. I know hope sounds awfully soft. Hope crashed before the Arab uprising. Hope crashed before Brexit. Hope crashed before Trump. But this is where you get huge swings of populism, and you can't find it. If you look at Tunisia, Egypt, and Bahrain, there was a perfect um, rise in average income in a very linear fashion. When you put the worst life, it was going like that. So you see, an economist would look and go, everything's fine. A behavioral economist would look and go, that place is ready to that place is ready to blow up. So, but I think I think a thriving or hope. Just one question. I think would change would, would would change everything. I'm going to make one other comment. So we built consistent sampling frames across 160 countries. We get you 98 percent of the population, eight eight billion people. But the question we were trying to figure out: What is the will of the world? What do people want once and for all? I'm going to make this so fast. What the whole world wants is a good job, period, full stop. That's men and women. But we're pursuing that more than we are. So back when I was a kid, is all you wanted as a young male was a woman, own a home, and you wanted a job for $20,000. You wanted to have a woman. You wanted to have three kids, 
own a house and not have to go to war. That was a great American dream. Now it's only one thing, and that is, can I get a job with a living wage? And that's the great global dream. And we monitor that as closely as we can. Economists use the most incompetent data that, that they can find for unemployment. It's crazy. Yeah, there's 8 billion people. ILO says 5% of, of, of the world are unemployed. Somebody ought to go to court for that number. 5%? You, you live in a world where 5% of the people are unemployed? It doesn't even pass the smell test. But remember, it's the most important issue in the world because when a, especially a young male doesn't have a job, you have no dignity, you can't get married, your whole life couldn't be worse. You know, when you see this kind of trouble, I'll just stay with the Arab uprising. When you see all those young males on Tour Square, where, wherever it was, what do you think they're mad about? They may not know, but what they do know is none of them have jobs. Remember the, the, the guy with the cart, Mohammed Bouzizi, when he was burning, remember what he was screaming? Americans think he was screaming death to America. Other ones thought he was saying Alu Akbar. Remember what he was saying? I just want to work. I felt like he was speaking for the, for the, for the whole world. But so while ILO shows 5% unemployment, you know what Gallup shows? 8 billion people, 6 billion adults. Of the 6 billion adults, 4 billion of them say, what I really want in life is a good job. Of the 4 billion, 2 billion have a good job. I call that 50% unemployment because the, the numbers that economists use right now include informal, which British had to have done that over gin and tonics. That's selling stuff in traffic, and you know what I mean, all of that. Um, it's a country club term, but, but you, can't count that as a, you can't count that as a good job. But the second thing I would say is get a real unemployment number because it's the single most imp important thing on earth. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let's give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this fireside chat. Um, we will open up now to the audience for a Q&A session. Uh, please raise your hands you, if you would like to ask a question. And we'll bring up a mic uh, to you. Hi, Jim. Uh, my name is Abhijit. I have one question for you with a reference that is it possible to identify human capital with sample references like Gallup service? Because let's say uh, you, you want to find those 7.5 Steve Jobs walking around Africa, or maybe you can exclude the 0.5 if you want to take Elon Musk out. So the, those seven uh, Steve Jobs, if they're really there as per the sample survey, they should be arriving on their own because the real Steve Jobs in the US, um, he came on his own. He didn't have to have the support system of the US economy or the US market. So why don't the seven steep jobs walking around Africa or doing whatever it is, why they are not coming up on their own if your sample is working properly? I would say two things. There are so many other things, especially with low income people in the United States of America, Numbers, that number is getting real. Sixty percent of people in America are broke at the end of the at the end end of the week. But but a lot of these young people um, uh, have so many other problems in their life. That one talent they have. Imagine a, 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 of having a a voice like Taylor Swift or something like that, where where th there's there's not an environment where anybody ever says, "Hey, you can really write a song and sing." And, and, and I think the same thing is true with, <clears throat> we're talking about intelligence, but it's not a natural thing. You know, your grandma can't spot it. Grandmas can spot singers and they can spot high IQ and all that kind of a thing. But that's one thing. Second thing is there's going to be a lot of little men and women, uh, young people that where the, their talent never really gets maximized. So they may have a very small business. They need people like you and me to help them. God, they make dumb decisions. And, and they also don't know that their best friend's really a banker, not investors. 
you don't need to do all that uh, uh, seed rounds and all that if you can figure out how to have a customer. And then, but see, they won't know any of that. And then they hit a wall and they stop. Three, three failures and they never try again. That's why you and I got to step in and make one of those three a, a, a booming success. But then maximize, maximize, maximize. I wonder how many of the state of America were. <clears throat> but I, I, I did okay. But boy, I had a lot of angels around me. You know, I had people that helped me where there was nothing in it. And if they wouldn't have helped me, my, my career would have been stopped because I had enough failure er, er, early on. But I think we live in a world where talent really, it's, it might, you know, do you ever wonder over 200,000 years or whatever you believe when humans do, why did leadership even develop as a phenomenon? You know, why did it evolve that way? Well, <clears throat> it might be because leaders are expected to help followers make better decisions and sustain themselves and have more productivity. That's what I think you see with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship really needs leaders, or I think it doesn't develop and grow. Well, that's a powerful point. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Avijit, for your question. Let's take one more question here. My name is Michelle Chivung. I'm CEO of Global Policy House, and I also work with AFCFTA on digital trade. Uh, my question to the president and yourself, Mr. Clifton, uh, we talked a lot around the women uh, and how women are really critical for growth, especially in Africa. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed as an entrepreneur, as an African woman entrepreneur, is the challenges, the severe challenges that us uh, uh, African women entrepreneurs face, especially when it comes to uh, accessing finance and capital. It is a real challenge. Now, one of the things that we are doing in our company is actually trying to solve that. So we look at digital assets, we look at artificial intelligence, we're building solutions using ethical AI uh, and blockchain. Now, my question to both of you is that why is it such a problem to actually finance uh, uh, African uh, uh, women businesses? And it's not just African businesses, just generally the world seems to have had an issue in terms of supporting and providing access to finance for women. How can we tackle this problem and how can we actually get serious about the women economy? Because I believe the women economy is hugely untapped and it can actually bring a lot of growth in the future for any continent in the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I don't think I, I, I can speak about our Frexen Bank. We do not have any problems financing women. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, and I say this with all due respect, women are, in charge, women are the people in charge of making the decisions about financing our Frexen Bank. So, so they cannot. Uh, <laughs> So they cannot discriminate against themselves. They make sure they follow the rules. I think the problem about women entrepreneurs emerging or businesses being supported goes to uh, uh, deep in the society. You ask yourself, how many uh, women-led businesses do we have in the first place? Uh, when you look at that, that would tell you how many that would rise to the level where they could apply for a loan. So what we need to do, especially in the African context, is to make sure we, uh, we do whatever we have to do to create women entrepreneurs so that they can then rise to a level where they're able to uh, uh, put forward bankable businesses. Uh, I, I think it's important, and for me, it's also important. I have three daughters, that, and one of them decided not to finish school, not to do anything, and went into business herself. So um, I, I, I know what you're talking about, but we have to get the culture of getting the women up, and the women themselves also have to have the confidence that they can do business they can run businesses because that's where it starts uh, when they have that confidence they are then able to um, um, develop that and perhaps get to a stage where they uh, apply for a loan uh, we know that there are some societies where even if the woman wanted they, they, they will not be able to get very far but increasingly those are becoming uh, few and far between. Uh, so the, the opportunities are there. And for any woman here who 
who has business to do and needs support, a present bank is open for business. And we have, <laughs> and we have clear examples to show for it. The women we've supported who are doing really big things, uh, manufacturing and uh, trading and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you have any ideas, any business, please uh, come to us. We will be able to support you if it's bankable. Thank you. Thank I'll you make, very much. Well, there you go, ladies. The message is clear. Um, would I'll you make like one to follow comment up? on that. that what, one of the things about entrepreneurs is that they'll pop out of companies, so they go and they learn. Gallup has spun off 100 companies, and you know we're not that. But we're not IBM years ago. I think spun off something like 10,000. I mean, but 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 I think the trick with women is that is that they've got to see somebody that looks like them higher in the organization, period. And <clears throat> I tell my clients, I started a company, it was all men. This is a long time ago, I, that, but all men. And then I was supposed to have some women, I couldn't really find any, I didn't know what to do and all that. But finally, I made the COO a woman. My theory is unless one, if you want to actually see women grow, one of those three top jobs has got to be a woman, or you will never do it. So anyway, I put her in, and I go to a, we got a great big 50-acre thing out in Omaha that has several hundred people and all that, but I walked, I walked into a room. I'm in Washington. I was checking in. Here's a big, big boardroom, and there's all women and one guy, and she's sitting at the end, and they're doing something. I don't know, but, but it's all women with one man, I'm, I suppose. 15, 16 women. I recognize some of them as being large managers. I just put my head in and said hello. And I said, what's going on in here? And the COO said, these are the people that run Gallup. And I said, uh, what do I do here? And she said, you are now the token. But, but until, until you make that move, and now we have six, 60% of our managers are women. I mean, it maybe it took too long, but we got there. But I don't think you'll ever get there until you, but the same thing is true with um, minorities. If, if people, if they can't see minorities in that senior management committee, all of those stupid processes and programs, none of them work. But the point is you can fix it. Thank you very much. We're, we're, we're taking one last question here on this side of the room, then it's time for us to wrap up. We want to make sure that you uh, have your dinner not too late tonight. So please, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shauke Shahed from the African Development Bank. Um, the question is to Mr. Clifton. In your wrapping up, you said that uh, till now, we don't know how to manage people. So what is your secret for managing people? Thank you. So when I was mentioning that once and for all study of super teams to real lousy teams, I asked our researchers at the very, those very, and he said they're like Navy SEALs. They can do assignments that appear impossible. And go get, everybody in this room's had an assignment that you go, this can't be done. And you let a team, and, and you know, you don't do it every day. But those are those up there, and then these other ones, and they also get injured and sue you and all that, so that's the whole thing. But so when you're doing a project, let's say it's Lean Six Sigma or anything, if you can find variation of six or eight percentage points and then lean that out, that's a really good thing. But one of our analysts came in scratching his head, and he said, this was a preliminary report for this thing that everybody was waiting for. He said, we found something in the secret of managing, developing people and teams we never found before. One phenomenon explains 70, 70 percent of the variance, just the manager. And so of all those programs and other things that you do where you waste money, you waste time, you waste productivity, you make client retention worse and all of that, the whole trick is just, is, is, is just, the, just the manager. And as I said before, what's the manager's job? It's having one meaningful conversation with you per week. And there's sort of a, you said, what's, what's the magic or miracle? That's realizing that it's just a manager 
The second thing is knowing what that primary activity is. Thank you. That is something we will definitely keep in mind. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for this fireside chat. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.